So this is a special session uh, devoted to uh, the topic of translation of the Theodicy, and there are two papers, each of which is going to take 30 to 35 minutes. The one will follow the other immediately, and then we'll have questions for both of them uh, after that. Uh, and the first paper is Greg Brown from the University of Houston, who will be speaking on the Theodicy and the leibniz Clark correspondence. Thanks, Justin. And thanks to Sam for allowing me to participate in this conference, especially since my paper is um, rather irregular, um, because I'm not concerned in this paper about any of the philosophical content of the, the Odyssey, but I am focusing on the influence it had via Caroline on the initiation of the leibniz clark correspondence. It is well known that Leibniz's theodicy had its beginning in discussions that were held in Lützenburg, just outside of Berlin, at the court of the Queen of Prussia, Sophie Charlotta, daughter of Leibniz's patron and friend in Hanover, the Electress Sophie. Those discussions had been occasioned by the publication of certain of Bale's works in which the Queen was quite interested, namely the second edition of Bale's Dictionary in 1702 and the publication in 1704 of the first volume of his collected works. I won't read that passage. All of this, I, as I've said, is well, known, uh, well enough known, but what is perhaps less well known is the fact that the future Princess of Wales and Queen of England, the then Princess Caroline of Ansbach, was almost certainly present at the discourses that Leibniz presented on bail at Sophie Charlotte's court in Berlin, and that she had been interested enough to engage Leibniz in private conversation about his views. Caroline was an orphan princess. Her father died within two years of her birth, and in 1696, when she was just 13, her mother also died. At that time, Sophie Char Charlotta was the electress of Brandenburg, and she and her husband, the elector Friedrich, offered to become Caroline's guardians. Thus began Caroline's sojourn at Sophie Charlotta's court at Lützenburg. But Sophie Charlotta died tragically in Hanover on 1 February 1705, <clears throat> at the age of 37, and Leibniz, who was still in Berlin at the time and was himself devastated to hear of the Queen's death, wrote to Caroline on 18 March 1705 after his return to Hanover. Leibniz began his letter with a sad and moving tribute to the Electress Sophie, to Sophie Charlotta, and to Caroline, saying that, quote, here are the three persons on the earth among those of your sex whom I, whom I not only honored infinitely with all reasonable and informed people, but whom I also cherish the most and whose kindnesses has given me and promised me the greatest satisfaction in the world, turned at a stroke into the object of the most violent pain and the most intense apprehension. But then he tried to console Caroline by reminding her of the discussions they had had at the court at Lutzenberg. Having finally arrived in Hanover two weeks ago, Leibniz wrote, I learned of two circumstances that have greatly consoled me. One is that the queen died a peaceful enough death as Monsignor, the elector, told me that she herself said to him, I die an easy death. The other is that when she, di that, that she died with a marvelous serenity of spirit and with lofty feelings of a tranquility of soul resigned to the orders of the supreme providence. It is what I deem to be most essential, and I believe that your serene highness, after having done me the honor at Lützenburg of wanting to understand and not rejecting my views on true piety, which demands this resignation, will permit me to say a little more about it. Leibniz then proceeded to touch briefly on themes that would later bulk large in the Theodicy, which was published five years later. That God is infinitely perfect and that he has therefore done everything in the most perfect way, even though we may not yet be in a position to perceive it clearly, that our love of God and our hope are therefore founded upon faith, which is an assurance of reason not yet verified by sense experience. Here, madam, he concluded, is that in which the three virtues of Christianity consist, faith, hope, and love taken in their general sense, constituting the essence of the piety that Jesus Christ taught us divinely well in conformity with the sovereign reason to which our reason scarcely attains without divine grace, although there is nothing so reasonable. I often spoke with the queen about this great principle of piety, of contentment, and of beatitude. It appeared to me that she approved of it, and even that her marvelous penetration made her understand it better than I could express it. The resignation of a tranquil spirit content with its God shone forth in her eyes and in her conduct to the last moment of her life. 
Caroline was thus exposed to some of the main themes of the theodicy long before it was published, and they were rendered indelible for her by the tragedy of events. On 2 March 1705, just seven months after the death of Sophie Charlotta and to the great delight of the Electress Sophie, the 22-year-old Princess of Anspach married Georg August, the son of Georg Ludwig, who was Sophie's eldest son. As a consequence, Caroline was caught up in the succession crisis that erupted in the late spring of 1714. As a, as a Protestant daughter of Elizabeth Stuart, who had herself been a daughter of the English King James I, the Act of Settlement of 1701, declared, quote, that the most excellent Princess Sophia, Electress and Duchess Dowager of Hanover, and the heirs of her body being Protestant, to be the next in succession uh, in the Protestant line to the imperial crown and the dignity of the realms of England, France, and Ireland. The Queen's health had begun to fail in the winter of 1713, and on 7 May 1714, the Elector Georg Ludwig and the Elector Sophie made a formal petition to the British representative at Hanover to allow a member of the royal family to reside in Great Britain as a representative, sorry, as a way of protecting the Protestant succession. But the Queen had long been adamantly opposed to allowing any member of the House of Hanover to reside in Great Britain during her lifetime, and her Lord of the Treasury, the Earl of Oxford, sent letters to that effect from himself and the Queen to the Electress, the Elector, and the Electoral Prince. The letters from the Queen, which had actually been drafted by Oxford, were especially harsh in tone, and they greatly upset the Electoral family, and especially Caroline and Sophie. On 7 June, two days after the letters were received, Caroline wrote to Leibniz in despair, but comforted, she said, by the theodicy. Quote, we were in crisis until the day before yesterday when a courier from the Queen arrived with some letters for the Elector, the Electress, and the Electoral Prince. These are of a violence worthy of my Lord Bolingbroke, and so the Electoral Prince is nearly without hope of going to assume his seat in the Parliament as the Duke of Cambridge in accordance with his rights. I do not know what the world may think of our conduct here. I do not so much regret the loss that our conduct may bring upon us as to have in some way abandoned the interests of our holy religion, the liberty of Europe, and so many brave and honorable friends in England. I have no consolation but to have seen everything humanly possible done to obtain this permission for the prince. The electress has joined forces with him, and they want to send the letters they receive from the queen to England. I find no consolation but to believe that providence does everything for our good, and your preface to the theodicy is a great comfort to me. Finally, sir, never has a sorrow seemed to me so violent and unbearable as this one. I fear for the health of the electoral prince and perhaps for his life. But it was for the life of the electress Sophie that Caroline should have feared, for on the evening of 8 June 1714, the day after Caroline had written her letter to Leibniz, Sophie collapsed and died in her arms as they strolled together in the garden at Herrenhausen. Of the three women that Leibniz had told Caroline he cherished the most, only Caroline now remained. And she consequently came to occupy a preeminent place in Leibniz's life during its final two and a half years. Writing to Caroline from Vienna on 7 July, he told her that she would have to be like Sophie's metempsychosis. And later in a letter from January of 1715, he told her that, for me, you take the place, madam, of queens and electresses. On 12 August, little more than three months after the death of Sophie, Queen Anne died. Georg Ludwig, Sophie's eldest son, had become king in England. His son, Georg August, was now Prince of Wales, and Caroline, the new Princess of Wales. Leibniz was in Vienna when he heard the news, and he returned to Hanover as quickly as he could, arriving on 14 September, but he was too late. Georg Ludwig and Georg August had departed for England three days earlier, but Caroline was still there, presumably, presumably preparing her children for the move to England. She would not depart until 12 October, and what she proposed during and the month between surprised even Leibniz. Writing to Count Bonneval in Vienna a week after his arrival in Hanover, Leibniz described the situation in the following terms. I came here in order to work this winter on some things which can free me from certain tasks that could delay my return to Vienna. He's referring there to the history of Hanover. But I am at present um, distracted from them here as I was at Vienna since the royal princess has wanted me to stay at the country estate at Herrenhausen, where she will be until her departure for England. I am very pleased to enjoy once more, as long as I can, the good graces of a princess so accomplished and so spiritual who even wants to go over with me again, would you believe it, the theodicy, 
which has, she has read more than once. It seems to me that I intend you, sir, to